Hi friends, today there will be an interesting project of a universal power source that can be used as a charger for portable power tools, and not only. The feature of this source is that, despite its relative simplicity, it stabilizes both the output voltage and current, that is, it can also be used to charge lithium-ion batteries. When designing it, I set the task of making a universal charger for screwdrivers. So the output voltage range is somewhere from 11 to 17 volts, and the current up to 3 amps. Both parameters are adjustable. This is enough to charge the most popular power tools, 12 volts, 14.4 volts, and 16.8 volts. But as the circuit is universal, the output voltage and current can be made other. In the description for this video, you can download the project archive with a printed circuit board. The board that will be shown in the video was the first option. Later, I corrected everything and the archive will contain new, more thoroughly worked out boards and Gerber files. They are in a separate archive. If you want to order a board at the factory, just take the archive with the name Gerber and upload it to the PCBWay company website. You don't need to change anything in the settings, just select the desired delivery method and make payment. After a while you will receive such beautiful factory boards. You will just assemble the circuit. The link to the website of the PCBWay company which produces high quality boards can be found in the description. By the way, new users will get coupons. Let's continue. The device is powered directly from the mains. It has all the necessary protections, including protection against short circuit and overheating. It consists of two main parts, main step-down power supply unit and a current and voltage stabilization unit. Due to the impulse conversion, the device has a high efficiency, small dimensions and weight. The power supply is built on the basis of a specialized microcircuit TNY 267 and the power of the charger depends on the choice of that chip. This is a wide line of specialized microcircuits that are widely used in all kinds of chargers and power adapters. The most powerful of this line is TNY 268, on the basis of which you can build blocks with a power of up to 23 watts. In fact, mains converter can have any power, even hundreds of watts if necessary. It is important that the converter has a feedback line. As we know, for correct stabilization of voltage and current, the PWM controller, on the basis of which the converter is built, must have two error amplifiers, for example TL494. A feature of our circuit is that voltage and current stabilization is realized through one single feedback channel. Let's go back to our TNY267 microcircuit. It was chosen for a reason. Firstly, power supplies based on this chip have a minimum outside components, and most importantly, a pulse transformer has only two windings, mains and secondary. There is no need an additional self-supply winding, which is necessary for many similar sources, and is designed to power the PWM chip after starting the inverter. In addition, the microcircuit already has everything you need to work, including a PWM controller, a protection system, and even a power transistor. It's convenient and cheap. I made several blocks using both TNY267 and 268. They work equally well. The second part consists of a dual operational amplifier LM358, a reference voltage source TL431, and small components. A pair of trimming resistors are provided the current and voltage adjustment. This node is the most important because it can be supplemented with any other power supply of any power and we will get a voltage and current regulated charger. Let's take a closer look at how this node works. The first channel of the operational amplifier is used for current stabilization, the second for voltage. In the current stabilization circuit we have a current shunt. In our case it is a low resistance 2 watt resistor. The reference voltage of 2.5 volts is set by the microchip 431. Here it works purely as a Zener diode. 
The specified resistor sets the stabilization current. Depending on the planned output voltage, it is necessary to recalculate this resistor value so that the stabilization current will be in the region of 5 to 10 milliamps. The reference voltage is fed through a resistive divider to the inverse input of the operational amplifier. It is important to note that one of the divider resistors is trimmer. By rotating it, we can change the reference voltage at the inverse output of the op amp. The voltage drop from the current sensor is fed to the direct input of the same op amp channel. When a load is connected to the output of the supply, a certain current will flow through the shunt, which will lead to a voltage drop across it. This voltage will go to the direct input of the op amp, where it will be compared with the reference voltage at the other input. If the voltage drop across the shunt is greater than the reference voltage, a high level is set at the output. The corresponding LED will light up and also the LED of the optocoupler in the feedback circuit will work. The microcircuit will instantly react to this. Its internal transistor will be in the open state for less time, therefore less power will go to the transformer. Naturally, the current in the secondary circuit will decrease. Therefore, the voltage drop across the current sensor will decrease until the voltages at the inputs of the op amp become equal. Voltage stabilization works in the same way. It is built on the second channel of the op amp. Here, a part of the output voltage is compared with the reference voltage. The glow of the second LED indicates that the unit works as a voltage stabilizer. That is, our supply works either as a voltage stabilizer maintaining the preset output voltage or as a current stabilizer limiting the output current at a given level. But there is one drawback that we will talk about at the end. Trimmer resistors will allow you to change the output parameters. The dividers in the reference circuits and the current sensor are designed for the specified parameters. If you need different voltage and current values, you will have to recalculate the reference circuits. But before you do this, you need to understand that everything depends on the power of the converter. You can't get more than 23 watts if the TNY268 is used and there is good cooling. Using Ohm's law, you can understand whether the microcircuit will allow you to build the source with your requirements. If not, then you can use another more powerful converter circuit and use this current and voltage stabilization unit. Transformer First, it is important to point out that our microcircuit operates at a fixed frequency of 132 kHz. In my source, an E-shaped ferry transformer with an initial permeability of 2300 is used. The winding data is indicated specifically for this transformer. In the case of other cores, the windings must be recalculated. This can be done using specialized programs and applications for calculating transformers for single-ended flyback power supplies. Pay attention to the presence of a non-magnetic gap between the halves of the core. In this case, the gap is about 0.3 to 0.4 mm. On the board and on the circuit, the dots indicate the beginning of the winding. If you confuse the beginning of the winding, the circuit will not work. In order not to confuse anything, it is advisable to mark the beginning of the winding, for example, by putting on a heat shrinkage. And one more feature. First half of the primary winding is wound on the bare frame. In general, you can do the whole winding at once, but this way is more correct. We wind layer by layer, insulate each layer, for example with Captain Heat Resistant Tape. One, two layers of insulation is sufficient. After winding half of the primary, we wind the entire secondary winding, also in layers, if it doesn't completely fit into one row. Next, on top of the secondary, we put three to four layers of insulation and wind the rest of the primary winding in the same way as the first half. As a result, we get four outputs from the primary winding. Every two wires are a solid winding and we mark the beginning of each winding. Now we take the beginning of one winding and connect it to the end of the other. According to the circuit, this output will not be used. 
As a result, we get whole primary winding. Now you need to assemble the transformer, not forgetting about the gap between the halves of the core. To get a gap, you can take, for example, a check from an ATM, cut a strip, fold it in half, and install it under the central or outer part of the core. Next, we tighten the halves of the core with the tape and install on the board. After a complete check of the circuit, the halves of the core can be glued for reliability. The output choke in my case is wound on a ferry dumbbell and has an inductance of 15 microhenry. I use the 0.7 mm wire, but practice has shown that the choke can be completely excluded simply by placing a jumper. This will not affect the operation in any way. The same can be said for mains filter. It will not create too much interference to mains because the power supply unit is low power. But of course it is more correct with a filter. Let's go further. At voltage dividers we must use precise and stable resistors with a tolerance of 1% or less. But in any case there will be some variation and it is rather difficult to ideally calculate the output voltage and current. But in the circuit we have trimming resistors that will allow very accurately to set the output parameters. Using this principle you can recalculate the power supply for your needs. You can get more current and higher voltage and also starting and charging device can be made. But we will talk about it in the following videos. If the device will operate in a sealed case without ventilation holes, then the power of the source must be reduced and it is advisable to glue a small heat sink to the TNY microcircuit using heat conducting glue. The disadvantage of such circuits is that the current stabilization will not work if the battery is not connected to the output of the circuit. Why is this happening? When a load is connected, the circuit automatically drops the voltage to maintain the set current. At some point, the output voltage becomes insufficient to power the operational amplifier and reference source. If a battery is connected to the output, then the previously mentioned nodes will be powered from the battery itself. That is, it is only necessary to set the charge current when the battery is connected. I repeat, it must be the battery and not another load. In fact, the second part of the circuit can be connected to any pulse power source with feedback. For example, the same charger based on Viper 22 PWM, here on FSDM311, and here is a more powerful version based on the current PWM of the UC3842 controller. And this is a starting and charging device based on SG3525. The principle of current and voltage stabilization is the same, only the currents here are already much higher. I think you understood how charging happens. In idle, without a connected battery, by rotating the indicated resistor, you need to set the voltage of the end of the charge. For example, for three cans of 3S lithium-ion batteries connected in series, that's 12.6 volts. At idle, a green LED will glow, which indicates that the unit is operating in voltage stabilization mode. Next, a discharged battery is connected and by rotating the second trimmer, we set the charge current. In this case, the green LED will go out and the red LED will light up. The unit is operating in the current stabilization mode. As the battery is being charged, the charge current becomes less than the set limit. The red LED will go out and green will light up. An important note, the output voltage of such supply shouldn't be higher than 32 volts. This is the maximum supply voltage for the LM358, which is powered directly from the output of the power source. The minimum output voltage can start from 3 to 3.5 volts, if necessary, but it is better to do it from 5 to 6 volts. Now let's do a couple of tests. Let's check the function of stabilizing the output voltage when the mains voltage is changed. The first multimeter shows the voltage at the input, the second at the output. A small incandescent lamp is connected to the output as a load. When the input voltage changes from 140 to 280 volts, the output voltage is very stable. Now let's connect the battery to the output. In series, a multimeter is connected to the power supply plus in ammeter mode. It will show the charge current, which is also stabilized. 
The first multimeter shows the input voltage as before. When the mains voltage changes in a very wide range, the charge current doesn't change. This means the excellent operation of the current stabilization function. The source is also protected from short circuits at the output but haven't protection from polarity reversal. So be careful and don't confuse the polarity of the battery connection even if the power supply is disconnected from mains. I have collected several such devices that have passed certain tests and are now used for their intended purposes. Today that's all. All necessary links, printed circuit boards and much more can be found in the description. Please don't forget to rate this video, subscribe to our group and to my Instagram. Now I say goodbye, until we meet again. With you was Kassian TV.